it's times like this when the power and the value of the STEM learning ecosystems community of practice becomes very visible. Presented by STEM at Home, an initiative launched by the STEM learning ecosystems community of practice, STEM Families Virtual Home Lab is a series of workshops to share practical tips, virtual experiments, and other concrete tools that families, even those with little time, few resources, and no STEM exposure or teaching experience can use to engage their children's learning. STEM education leaders from across the country will offer a variety of activities for different age groups to engage students in STEM learning with resources that you have around the house. Before we begin, we want to let you know about a few Zoom features that we'll be using. First, we recommend sharing your thoughts and questions in the chat box. We have education experts from TIES and STEM sports in there answering your questions. We'll also be posting a PDF of the PowerPoint and links to resources in the chat for everyone to have easy access. Next, we may bring participants on live to ask questions or to show what they've learned. In this case, we'll share your camera so that everyone can see and hear you. Finally, you can find all of our webinars and podcasts on our YouTube page. Search STEM Ecosystems and subscribe or access the links on our website, stemecosystems.org. Let's take a moment and introduce our guest hosts. I, uh, I, those of you who, uh, who know me really well, you know that I love sporting. Um, I'm here at the, uh, the Cleveland uh, Sporting Center. Um, and uh, we today with us have folks from STEM Sports. We have Jeff Golner, the president and CEO, Sean Barton, leading curriculum development at STEM Sports, and Rachel Kistner, who's a teacher and who works with the curriculum team to ensure it's useful for teachers and parents. So, uh, Jeff, why STEM Sports and how can your content help people during these difficult times? Yeah, you bet. Um, you know, uh, uh, in a typical time, we have curriculum that goes into classrooms, after school programs, and camps that it's real simple. We use sports as our real life application to teach STEM uh, so that we can improve children in K through 8 uh, liter literacy in STEM so that they have a really uh, strong chance and are better positioned for the workforce when that time comes because we all know that that's what STEM is all about, uh, that we need to, you know, produce a lot of humans to fill the roles uh, that are being uh, developed each and every day through the advancement in technology and whatnot. And then at home, yeah, so we've had a pivot. Obviously, we've had to adapt because we know that children aren't in school. We also know that parents are at home with their children and, and have suddenly become, if you will, teachers or, or even aides to, the, to teachers. And so we pulled some of our curricula and made it uh, available, at no cost, so that it can be utilized at home um, with very little equipment in some cases, and also the ability to get outside and have some physical activity is another big piece of that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we want to know where all of you are from, so let us know in the chat. Tell us what city you're in and where you're coming from. And all the way from Tulsa, Oklahoma, we have the Frazier family, our STEM family for today. Mabry Ellen Frazier is nine and very involved in gymnastics. Her father, Brandon Frazier, is also joining us today. Brandon's a worship director at his church and uses his love of music to uplift his community. Mabry, what's your, uh, what's your favorite exercise to do? Squats. Squats. You've, <laughs> I think you were the only person in the history of exercise <laughs> to have listed squats. How long have you been doing gymnastics? Two years. Yeah, something like that. A couple of years, yeah. Couple of years. That's uh, that's really awesome. It's a a really incredible workout. Um, my daughters both do gymnastics and cheer, and and I can see that they're working harder, frankly, than I've ever worked. Uh, Brandon, what tips do you have for families that don't have a teacher as a parent, but are trying to, um, you know, balance kind of continuing to work and also uh, helping their kids to learn? Um, I, I I would say just kind of take uh, seize the seize the opportunities that you have. Um, that you know look for those opportunities um, and, and I think another great way is just to lead by example you know you've got to um, how, how will how will your you as a parent how will you be able to lead your kids there if you're not going there yourself so uh, those are just a couple of things that I, I would probably say more than anything um, that, that, that would help uh, I, yeah no I, I think so too. And, and I think that one of the things uh, parents who are listening that, that's really important to focus on is um, that it is okay. Um, this is something teachers are, are you know, doing more and more of, that it's okay to not have the answers. That's really good for our kids, um, for you not to have the answers and so that they can see you just kind of work through it with them and figure it out. It's uh, the best way to teach that, that ability to kind of find a problem and tackle it. Well, I don't know about the two of you, but I'm really excited to get started, um, to get moving a little bit. I've got my, my sports headband on. Um, so uh, Rachel, you ready to take us away? Oh, for sure. I'm excited uh, to get us all a little active this morning, or 
Well, it's morning for me. Some of you, it's afternoon. Um, all right, so let me pull up our uh, info for you. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get you active and going right away. Um, Jeremy here has some huge cards. Jeremy, can you show him those cards? Yes, I can. I set them down to get them out of the way, and I've got my, my kids' giant cards here. All right, so he's going to lead you through some fitness activities. Here's how it works. It's super easy. He's going to pull a card up, and you have to do how many of those uh, the card says. And so we have our clubs, our squats, um, our spade is sit-ups, um, our jumping jacks is a diamond, and our heart is a push-up. It's really important that you go... Um, fast because we're going to take our heart rate after this so that we can go ahead and measure our heart rate. All right, uh, Jeremy, you want to go ahead and get started on that? Absolutely. So I'm going to just grab, I've been kind of, it's very hard to shuffle these giant cards, uh, but I've been kind of <laughs> shuffling them to grab the top one and I've got a three of clubs. Nice, easy start. All right, three squats. Let's go. Yeah. One. Two, three. Okay. Awesome. What's up next? Next up, I have a four of diamonds. Ooh, four jumping jacks. Let's go. Three. Three. All right, Jeremy, let's just keep pulling them in quick succession so we sure, can get All right, that. seven of diamonds. Seven more jumping jacks, right? Yep. And I put in the chat for you what the cards mean, uh, so you can go ahead and, and reference there. And I have the four of hearts. And if you're watching this at home, uh, whether you're an adult or a kid, make sure you're getting up and doing these. Um, we want to get those, those heart rates up fast. So nice, big, right, squats and, uh, and jumping jacks. Uh, and I've got a four of hearts. Four push-ups. All right. Keep on going. Oh, wait. People are exercising. Yeah, people are still going. All right, Frazier family, you're, uh, your camera's live. Everyone's watching you exercise. We have the six of clubs. What was that? Uh, squats. Wow. Six squats. And I just pulled the eight of diamonds. Ooh, we're at jumping jacks again. Eight jumping jacks. <laughs> we do one more rachel yeah let's do a few more all right got the uh seven of spades seven push uh sit-ups right sit-ups yeah that's one we haven't seen yet <sighs> all right Great. i hope I hope everyone... say, uh, Brandon, I, I, I hope you're aware that Mabry's kind of killing you. She's getting these uh, about half the time that you are. Uh, is this our last one, Rachel? I've got the two of hearts. All right. Two push-ups to wrap us up. All right, guys, how are you feeling? Do you feel like your heart rate's nice and high? That's good. All right. All right. Uh, everybody in the audience can do this, too. We're going to go ahead and take our heart rate. Um, so you can do this by um, on your wrist right here. And then um, Sean, our, our other uh, STEM sports guy, he's going to be doing it on his neck. And you just count for 30 seconds. So I'm going to set us a timer here for 30 seconds. And you're going to count the number of beats that you hear. Starting now. So while they're, uh, while they're counting, Rachel, um, how bad is it that I didn't do any of those exercises and my heart rate is 105? I'm just Ooh. very excited, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think I got to. Um, all right, that's our timer. Go ahead and uh, have that number in your head, and I want you to multiply it by two. Um, so I was about 45. Uh, Jeremy there with 105 heart rate, you would have been, what, at like 53? 
Um, so he would take his 53 for that 30 seconds and he would multiply it by two. And then you can go ahead and add this in your data table here. Um, right here where it says playing card fitness where we played. So just add your heart right there. If you have other people in your household, you can go ahead and add uh, their heart rates in here. All right, Jeremy or Jeff, can you go ahead and um, put some of those discussion questions in the chat? Um, and then kiddos at home, I want you to go into your cupboard or fridge and pull out some of the foods that you had for breakfast. Uh, so I'll give you a minute to do that. I got some bread and jam here because that was my healthy breakfast. Um, go ahead, pull something out and start looking at those questions in the discussion. Um, I think Jeremy, if you have, right, Jeremy, if they have, if they want to share their discussion, they can flag you down or wave, right? Um, so yeah, for right now, we're, um, uh, kids are in the chat. We're, um, we're putting some questions there. Uh, answer. If you're interested in uh, answering kind of live on camera, let us know that too in your answer and we'll, uh, we'll call on some of you to, to share live. So that first question that we have is, how do you know how much food to eat each day? I know I just eat enough until my stomach starts to stick out and I get a little bit dizzy and that's kind of a sign to me that I've had enough for the day. <laughs> So Rachel, while we're uh, waiting for some uh, of our of our of the students who are who are listening to to answer in the chat, um, what kinds of things should we be thinking about when we're thinking about uh, food in our snacks? Oh man, I mean, you definitely want to think about fruits and veggies. I mean, that's where I go first. Um, Minus today, I actually had just fruit and, and cheese for breakfast. This wasn't my, my real breakfast. Um, I have fruit, cheese, and nuts every morning for breakfast because there's lots of fat and sugar that keeps me full through um, the morning. So, um, and as you're thinking about food, you know, you want healthy fats, you want healthy sugars, so less of the processed sugars, um, more of those whole sugars that come from fruits and vegetables um, and whole grains. So I see um, a few people in the chat are saying things like calories, um, you know, so they might count their calories. Some people are saying based on your height and weight. I'm, I'm curious about um, Mabry. Um, Mabry, how do you know what um, you should eat in a, you know, any given day? Is it more, I think, is it more maybe kind of what you're, what you're going to be doing that day, primarily? She burns a lot of calories at, uh, uh, not just calories, but she burns a lot of, at, at the gym because uh, she's there for sometimes three or four hours a day. Um, so it's, it's a lot. Now, not recently, but uh, sure. I'd say probably to a large degree, we, we, we had to kind of have this discussion because it was, um, she's never really eaten a whole lot since she was a kid. She just never really ate, you know, and it's just she ate a little bit and she would, yeah, and that would be enough for her. Um, but since she's growing and building muscle and things like that, um, what she's putting into her body is actually becoming more important now uh, for her. It's first system of ability throughout. So yeah, that makes sense. Rachel, uh, Jacob in the chat is saying, you know, you've eaten enough when you're full. It's simple. Um, is that, a, is that a, a good gauge of whether or not we've had enough to eat? I mean, I think most times that's a good gauge. Um, I do know that our bodies don't tell us we're full right away. So as we're eating, um, and we're still finishing our meal, our body doesn't automatically think that we're full. So we may actually be eating more than what we need um, when we think about that full tendency. Um, hey, STEM sports guys, you guys want to add to that at all? No, I think that's a really good point. Uh, you hear that all the time is that uh, you should really stop eating before you get full because like you just said, Rachel, your body doesn't really um, kind of notify you until, well, it's too late. It depends also how physically active you are. Uh, oftentimes, I know I don't get enough proteins after I've worked out, so I'm not going to be as full as quickly versus if I'm not working out, I kind of have to scale back a little bit my diet. Of course, before I'm going to, to work out your physical activity, as Rachel said earlier, more sugars, healthy sugars, um, as well as some protein here and there is a good, is a good route. 
And I think that's an excellent segue into our next question. Um, do you feel more hungry after playing sports or being active or is it kind of the same for you guys? Why don't you put that in the chat? What are you thinking kiddos? Um, do you get hungry when you're playing outside more often or not? So if you're, if you're a, a, a kid or an adult uh, listening right now, uh, make sure you're putting that in the chat. Um, if you have kind of a lazy day where you're sitting around playing video games, watching TV, how hungry are you? Or if you go to gymnastics or to uh, play baseball or to run around or jump on the trampoline, are you hungrier on those days that you're, um, that you're, you're more active? So um, I'm going to see if we can pull um, Jacob really quick, uh, who's got lots to say about um, his intake of calories. Jacob, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Hey, Jacob. There um, so um, do you feel hungrier after you work out or exercise? Not really. I just, I, I just, I don't know. I just don't. You don't, yeah. I, I think probably bodies are all are all different. But what does that mean, uh, Rachel or or Jeff? Um, are we is Jacob somehow kind of magical and not expending more energy? Well, I mean, it's definitely different for kids and adults too. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and glance at that next slide here. Oops, sorry, technical difficulties as I pull up. Um, so, uh, here you'll see the calorie range for your different age group and activity level. And so depending on how active you're being, um, that actually might not change too much, right? So we see here in, in our four to eight age range and our nine to 13 age range that we're only going up by, you know, 200 calories, um, 600 calories at the most here from being not active at all to super active. So if you're already eating those calories that you need and you're being active, you might not feel more hungry. I think it's always a surprise to people is, uh, at least it is to me that after a really hard workouts, I think sometimes people think they, they've burned off the equivalent of, you know, a Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and if you look at the calories that you've burned after a really hard workout, it's nowhere near the equivalent of a Thanksgiving dinner, right? Exactly. And, you know, there's been some research out there that those fancy watches that everyone wears now um, actually overestimates how many calories you're burning. So we shouldn't necessarily eat to replace our calories, but um, as someone said in the chat, eat when you're hungry. All right. So now that we've been um, resting a little bit, is this, has enough time elapsed for us to take a look at what our resting heart rate is? Yeah, before we do that though, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how that food we've been talking about turns into the energy that we use when we work out. And this is kind of where we're gonna connect into those next generation science standards that teachers and educators talk a lot about. Um, so I'm not gonna go into super depth because I know you all don't wanna listen to me talk for you know half hour on, on cells and ATP. So I'll just give you a quick little overview here, right? So we know that our body intakes uh, sugar and nutrients through the food that we eat and our body breaks this down into something called macromolecules and then our cells this actually tiny little thing the mitochondria in our cells takes that and oxygen and takes those sugar molecules and it turns them into an energy source that our body uses on the cellular level called ATP and um, in the PowerPoint you can actually click on this link and there's a cool TED ed that goes a little far in depth into that um, so that'd be a great thing to do after the video. And so it's really important that when you are exercising, especially when you're really active or you're, um, you know, like a gymnast and you're going to perform, you want to eat a little bit of sugar beforehand, those healthy sugars. It's kind of why people have pasta dinners before they work out. Um, or like run a big race or bike a big race um, because those sugars are going to break down really fast into that energy that your cell needs. And the more oxygen you bring in often brings up your heart rate. Um, so Sean here is going to talk for a minute about how we can tell um, the relationship between our heart rate, our MET, 
and the calories burned. Sean, will you take it away for us? You bet. So, yeah, you know, so the MET value is, you know, it stands for metabolic equivalent task, which sounds really complicated. It's not. We're going to keep it very simple. So versus sitting and, and chatting with a friend versus or playing cards in the front or a board game um, versus if I'm playing basketball, you know, just playing with a friend, sitting, sitting, playing a video game with a friend is probably one, 1 1.5 versus seven, 8.0 if I'm out there playing a competitive game of basketball. It's kind of the best way to look at the met value and what it really represents. In more specific terms, it's basically the amount of oxygen our body uses. And there's a way to calculate that, but we're not going to go in depth on that. So just keep in mind, and as we segue further down into the into this our presentation day or our session, that the met the low end, 1, 1 1.5, we're not doing a whole lot. It's close to our resting heart rate rate versus when we started to get into the, the, the um, playing cards, you notice that heart rate go up. So that net value is going to go up a little bit. So here's the example I was kind of talking about was, you know, playing outside. Let's just say we're shooting hoops with a friend, mom or dad, you know, it could burn 300 cal calories quickly. And we're about that between one and eight, that halfway point at about four. So that's still good. You're still active. Get a little more competitive playing half hour, you know, basketball uh, competitive game. You're talking, you know, closer to 600 calories, six point met. Then we talk about really going through those cards. We would kept going through those cards for another, you know, five, six, seven minutes. We really we got that heart rate up. And then we're at that peak point of around eight. And hey, now we're, now we're really starting to burn some calories. We got to start eating. We got to replace those calories. And stepping back to what Rachel was talking about a little bit was, Really important to get those good sugars before you go. When I was a coach, um, and I coached cross country, basketball, soccer, I needed my athletes to make sure they got those good sugars in so they had that energy before they started. Man, all this talk about sugar, I really Sorry, my, my, I apologize. My, my screen went blank. I'm still here. Um, so that it's really important to, to make sure that we get those sugars after and then, you know, proceeding that the proteins, carb, carbs to, to kind of, or proteins to make sure we kind of replace that, uh, all that energy that we've burned and we've used as Rachel explained in the, how the body converts food to energy. Hey Jeremy, what'd you have for breakfast again? Uh, yeah, I, um, you guys told me to, to bring my breakfast in. Um, I uh, like to make sure that I'm giving high quality food to my body because I have a long day of work. So this morning I took this Hershey bar and I dipped it in this Nutella. Um, and that's what I had for breakfast. Uh, how about you? Um, as I said, I had some fruit, um, cheese and nuts because, you know, got to stay healthy as I'm sitting at my desk all day. <laughs> Because I'm doing a lot less exercise than when I'm in the classroom wandering around and seeing students. Um, so it looks like you, we should maybe calculate how many hours of playing card fitness you would have to do um, to burn off your chocolate bar dipped in Nutella. Sure. So we're going to actually do that next and get into some common core math standards. Um, so that's kind of the teacher speak for, you know, how the heck we do math in the classroom. But before we do that, um, I want, since we have been resting, and like Jeremy said, uh, we've been resting for a little while, so I want to take our resting heart rate, which is at a MET 1. So that's the heart rate, and I'm going to put 30 seconds on the timer as I explain it. So get your fingers on your wrist or your neck so we can take that resting heart rate in 3, 2, 1. All right, we're going to... Fingers up on the wrist and start counting. Yeah, we're going to count for 30 seconds here. Um, so heart rate and MET go together, right? So as your heart rate starts to increase, that, that MET value that Sean was talking about on our slides also starts to increase because you need more oxygen to pump that heart faster. Can we see some people taking their heart rate? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually gonna go to, uh, I see over in the corner, uh, the uh, the Quinn family, and I'm going to uh, spotlight their video. So I see Lily and Sam Quinn taking their heart rate. I'm going to unmute them. All right, we just made it to 30 seconds. How many beats did you have? 70. So 70. <laughs> All right, I lied. We were actually way over 30 seconds. <laughs> we just a full minute. Um, so. 
uh, I'm sorry, Jeremy and I were talking and changing cameras. So the number that you had, you don't have to multiply that by two this time. You go ahead and you put that number um, right in your data table if you have it available. So um, our people on the screen, yours would just be 70. So you would go ahead and you would put 70 in your data table right here. Okay. So you should have two different different uh, numbers filled in, in your chart right now. You've got um, one that was after all that exercise and one that was your resting heart rate. Might be a little bit higher than your real resting heart rate because we did that exercise not all that long ago. But you can kind of get the idea of taking that heart rate when you're calm and relaxed and have not done any activity for a while. Yeah, excellent. And in, in best practice, we would take our resting heart rate right away when we wake up in the morning, when we're really calm and we haven't done any physical activity, but that's okay. Uh, we're gonna leave it as is now. The last thing we're gonna do with our heart rate is calculate our maximum heart rate. So this is where we get, we're doing exercise that's so intense that our heart rate reaches like the max that it should be at. So we generally don't wanna be over this heart rate. Sometimes it happens. Um, so you're going to take the number 220 and you're going to subtract your age from it. So um, I am, well, so let's say you're 12, right? So you're going to take 220 minus 12. Anyone tell me the answer there in the chat? I know it might be a while since you guys did the math there. Well, I'm, mine's really easy. I'm 20 years old, so 220 minus 20 is 200. Oh, perfect, perfect, so yeah. So easy. All right, so hopefully you got 208 if you were, uh, <laughs> if you're 12, if you were doing that example with me. If not, go ahead and do that for yourself. So as you can notice, the older you are, the lower your max heart rate's gonna be. All right, so again, heart rate goes up. Matt goes up. Everyone take a really, really deep breath. <sighs> all right, you can let it out. We all know that we're breathing in oxygen. As, as Sean said, oxygen is the key component to when we're looking at Met. So we're going to do some more math here, guys and gals. And I know for some of you, you may not have been doing a whole lot of math um, since you've left school, um, but we're going we're gonna to get into that. So what I need you to do right now is either ask your parent or go stand on a scale if you have one or estimate your weight in pounds. So while you're asking your parents, um, I'd like to uh, go over to, to Mabry and, and Brandon. Uh, so Mabry, first of all, what was your resting heart rate? Yeah, yeah your resting heart rate. Six. And then do you know about how much you weigh? You don't have to run off and go jump on a scale. Do you know about how much you weigh? Wait, what? 63.8. 63.8. Uh, so Ooh. Rachel, if, um, if Mabry's, uh, you know, so we've, we've got a resting heart rate, we've got her active heart rate, um, we've got her weight, what does she do with that? She divides that by two. Um, if you wanna do some little more complex math, you can divide it by 2.2, um, but our elementary age kids, you just divide that by two. And then from there, um, we are going to, multiply that by the met value. So we're gonna look at the met value if we were doing that playing card fitness for a longer period of time. Um, you know, we, like you said, we gotta help Jeremy figure out how long it's gonna take him to burn off that candy bar and Nutella. So we're gonna use the met value of eight, okay? Met value of eight here. So we're gonna multiply your weight divided by two. So um, maybe you were 68 pounds, you said? 63.8. Ah, 63.8. All right. Ooh, that's so specific. All right. So we're dividing that by two and then we're going to, so that's about 32. We're going to round up. It's 31.9, but we're going to round up to 32. And then we're going to multiply that by the met value of playing cards, which is eight. Uh, can I have either Jeremy or Sean, can you put uh, that info in the um, chat for us so kiddos can see it when I on share? Yeah, so Sean can put that in there. And then kids, I'd like to mention too, if you're here without a parent and you need a little bit of help with this math, go ahead and ask in the chat and uh, Julie or one of the other folks that are in the chat will can kind of give you a hand. Perfect. Yeah, so then once you have the value of your weight divided by two, multiplied by the met value of eight, 
we're going to multiply it again by the number of hours that you per participated in the activity. Now, we only did the activity for five minutes. Um, so we're actually going to just multiply it by one to get the amount of calories that we would burn if we did this for a whole hour. So if you did that playing card fitness for a whole hour. And if you know the laws um, or the rules of multiplying or and dividing by one, you'll know that it's the same answer. So Mayberry, what did you get for your answer? Okay, so you got 60, she, so her kilograms are 60, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you're 29, 29 kilograms, you're 29. 29 kilograms, yep, 63 divided by, or 60 divided by two. Yep. And then we we took uh, we took twenty nine, and we and how did we get six? How did we get sixty? I don't even remember. Well, six, or, so, so sixty three, right? Divided by uh, two, right? What about two? Yeah, it's thirty. Yeah, thirty one. Thirty one. Okay. So thirty one, and then we're gonna multiply thirty one by eight. And that is two forty eight. 248. And so if we're going to take 248 and multiply it by the hours, we would have of hours of one. Hours of one would be 248. So. 248. So if you did what we were doing at the beginning for one hour, you would burn 248 calories. That's awesome. That's a, it's a little bit of a problem for me though, Rachel, because oh, no. my breakfast was 480 calories. Holy moly. So, but you have a different weight. That's true. Ah, so your data might be a little different uh, than Mayberry's here. And what this is telling me too is maybe I should have gone for a, for a cutie or an apple or something. Probably. I mean, that sugar might have, hey, that's why your, your non-resting heart rate was so high at the beginning when you said it was 105. It's probably because you ate all that sugar. So I, I've got a, um, I mean, I'm, what I'm, something I'm curious about, I, I think you guys probably are too. I really wonder, um, the kids who are here with us uh, today, um, what they ate for breakfast. Um, so we can kind of get a handle on how many calories um, they might have eaten. Um, so I'm going to probably make some of your parents mad. Sorry, um, parents. Go ahead and go into your kitchen, into your cupboards, and see if you can safely find what it was that you ate, especially if it has one of these uh, nutrition labels on the back um, so that we can take a look um, at how many calories you ate. So go ahead, uh, leave the camera for a second, it's okay. See what you can find, if you can find the foods that you ate and bring them back and share with us. Rachel, while they're doing that, what else can we be thinking about? Yeah, so we did just one sample uh, math problem today on the webinar, um, but there in the lesson plan and on your worksheet, there are many different um, calculations that you can do for your resting heart rate or a met of one. So you can figure out how many calories you're burning just by sitting there, because we do burn calories when we're just sitting too. Um, and then you can calculate how many calories you would be burning at different uh, time interval. So I think on the worksheet, we have half hour. Um, we have a half hour or 10 minutes, a half hour, 60 minutes and 90 minutes. So definitely some good math practice there. And additionally, if you're in middle school or above uh, on the worksheet, oh, I'm seeing some labels come up on the screen right now. <laughs> Um, if you're in middle school or above, you can go ahead and look at that worksheet and that lesson plan. And we're going to do some stuff with slope and graphing these in equations, um, in slope intercept equations. So really getting that math, uh, that M and STEM going this, this afternoon. All right. So, so what's up next? All right. Up next, we're just gonna think about um, and compare those numbers. So later in the day, if you wanna go in and calculate this, it's gonna be really interesting to see the difference in calories that you burn from doing exercise for an hour versus just sitting and playing video games or watching TV for an hour. And as we discussed, you know, those calories that you uh, eat, you're gonna need to eat a few more calories um, when you're doing exercise. So we're gonna wrap up here. Um, thinking about uh, your what you had for breakfast and 
thinking about playing card fitness and the number of calories you're burning when you're doing that, what are some of your goals for physical activities and calories during this time when we're kind of stuck at home? Um, I know that I'm not as active as I normally am, and I know that I'm eating way more chocolate cake than I normally would. Um, so put that in the chat and we'd love for, to hear from you. If you, if you wanna come on camera, let Jeremy know that you'd be willing to share out loud too. So I'm gonna go over to uh, uh, Lucy. Uh, Lucy, what are you doing um, during, during this quarantine to stay active? How are you staying active? I stay active. I jump on my trampoline and I play outside. Play outside? Oh, that's awesome. Good. Are, are you doing any other activities? Do you do gymnastics or? I, I cheer. Are you still doing cheer? Yes. How do you do cheer stuck in the house? I go on a Zoom and we do um, cheer like what we would normally do in um, a normal cheer class, but we don't do stunts. Gotcha. So you do it a, a, a little bit, a little bit smaller, maybe, but keep moving. That's awesome. Uh, Reagan, um, what about you? What are you doing to stay active? I ride my bike around the cul-de-sac a lot, and we just went for a ride, ride around the golf course. Awesome. So, um, Rachel, Jeff, Sean, what else should uh, or can kids be doing right now to to continue to stay active when they're kind of stuck inside a house or an apartment? They're you doing. Think that Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. I was just going to say, you know, that playing card fitness that we did at the very beginning is a great activity to do with the whole family. And we suggest doing it maybe three times a, a, a day where you can kind of break up your day and have a little bit of fun and just spark some movement and get your heart rate going. And I mean, come on, who doesn't love seeing dad or mom do some push ups? I think that's, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to, no, great, great point. You know, mix it up, you know, have balance throughout the day. It's okay to, you know, sit and enjoy TV. However, get up, take a walk. It doesn't have to be anything overly rigorous or difficult. Uh, it can be like um, Regan was saying, it could be riding your bike, the right way to do it, rollerblading, you know, going for a walk in the front, just shooting baskets, playing tennis. There's so many ways you can get exercise um, <clears throat> just to get out of the house and get fresh air. So all, all good things, but Make sure though you're, you're trying to eat well and eat right as we went over earlier. I'm gonna uh, go to one more. I'm gonna ask uh, Lila Shore, no relation to me. Uh, Lila, um, what are you doing to stay active? Um, jumping on the trampoline with Lucy, doing almost the same stuff that Lucy's doing. <laughs> I, saw you, stuff. I saw you playing a, a video game the other day that got you moving around. Oh yeah, um, I think it's called like something fit. What is it called? <laughs> I think it's a uh, ring fit adventure. Yeah, ring fit adventure. And like you have a you have a ring, it goes with the switch, and you snap um the controllers into the ring and a strap around your leg and you run sometimes and sometimes you get in mud and you have to do high knees. You do squats and, also, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the key, I think, is to find whatever way that you can to stay active. It can be really hard. It's, it's, it's hard for me. Yeah, yesterday I saw, you know, a family racing each other on our afternoon walk. And I take my dog for a walk every day, and that's how I stay active. And, and mom won, so she's clearly the fastest. Um, all right, so I think we are ready to wrap up our lesson um, and move into kind of the STEM sport talk piece. Before we did that, I just want to touch base to any teachers or parents um, in our space, our, our virtual space today, about our lesson format, because it's really easy to do if, you know, even if you don't have a teaching background, and those of you who are teachers in the audience, um, we did what's called a 5E model. And this is a research-based practice that's been in education for 25 years. And basically you start with something that's really engaging for the kids and active and let them do the thinking. So that, that was a lot of our discussion questions at the beginning and, and getting active right away. And then you take a moment to explain something or you know give your kid a video on YouTube uh, so that they can get that kind of like content or lecture that um, is traditional in the classroom. And then you go and you dig deep and so that's when we were doing our calculations. And then you check in to see um, what, 
what they learned. And so this is a really good way to just build something little at home and let your kids explore and figure things out first and then take a minute to explain and, and get them to do the math or, or the, the science portion then. I think that makes sense. So, um, uh, Rachel, there's some folks asking in the chat. Uh, Chuck Barlow is asking, how can teachers and parents incorporate active learning activities like the ones shared here using cross-curricular strategies and to assist students in mastering standards? So, in other words, how can we add active components to learning, but not just for the sake of active? How can we add active components that actually help our students learn? Yeah, I mean, I'll just speak a little bit to uh, my teaching experience right now. I'm teaching speed and motion and kinetic and potential energy to my students virtually. And so I get my kids out doing virtual field trips and labs. So as simple as like walking and measuring your speed, um, jumping up and down and explaining the kinetic and potential energy in that. So you, you, a lot of it from the teacher perspective is really thinking creatively. And you know what, Google's a powerful thing. I'll tell you as a teacher, I Google, you know, active lessons for, for acceleration all the time um, and things like that. And parents can do the same thing. And it's just kind of getting through the jargon or the language and kind of ignoring it um, for our time and place right now and, and finding the meat of those lessons. All right, so what, what do we have um, to wrap up here? What are our final thoughts that we should be thinking about? Uh, Sean and Jeff, you're taking that away? Yeah, I'll go into kind of the, the next just around and great question by Chuck around and he's asking more specific to how we tie in the standards. So we create something that's not just physical, but it's learning based. So we have the academic side, which is STEM for us, the sports side, which is active. And that's where the standards do come into play as well as our objective for each lesson that we, we provide for, for families and students um, is very beneficial. Um, and there's a reason that those, those standards exist. Uh, they set clear and measurable goals, they ensure accountability and prepare students for future exams, and they measure achievement and preparation for students um, moving into the academic and, and uh, their professional careers. So, of course, STEM sports, we certainly provide um, a very healthy, from an academic and physical standpoint, uh, curriculum. And so, if there's, is there like curriculums, I guess, as Chuck's asking, out there, probably not a lot like what we do. It's what kind of makes us unique, but we're also very proud of that. We, we, we like that very much, and we hope you guys benefited from it as, as well today as a sample of what we do. So, but there are, as, as Rachel said, resources out there. Google search engines, search engines are, are a good way, a good thing to, to be able to do some research on resources out there. And getting into, you know, the, the standards we use, Common Core State Standards, which is mathematics, next generation science standards we use as well. Um, again, they're applicable throughout all of our lessons, but again, like I said, they do hold, hold our teachers, students accountable to ensure they're on the right path as far as their, their academics as well as eventually their careers. So we'll kind of segue into any questions that you guys may have. Um, and we, again, we hope you found today's lesson, lessons beneficial, which sounds like most of you did. We hope you enjoyed it. But any questions you might have, definitely throw them out there, either verbally or in the, in the chat room. So I think I've got a good question here that, that might be a good uh, one for us to, to close on potentially, um, is uh, from Chuck again, who's asking um, about coaches who have, um, you know, they have their athletes, they have their athletes stuck at home, and they're wondering if there's ways to use STEM sports or the STEM sports curriculum to engage with um, their teams and athletes that are stuck, from, stuck at home. <laughs> I'd be happy to take that one. Absolutely. Um, great question, Chuck. That's why we're here today is because we certainly want to help um, students and, and parents at home. And then certainly we also still know, like Rachel's still doing, she's still teaching class virtually and from a distance. And so um, at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we shared that we have several lessons available at no cost. Um, by visiting stemsports.com, you'll see a quick button that you can click called uh, free lessons. You can also go direct at stemsports.com slash samples, and then we'll fulfill that request and send you a lesson very similar to what you saw today with our uh, heart rate and count, uh, counting calories and heart rate. So after that, we sell and provide these curricula as large supplements um, to schools and after school programs and camps all across the country. We're in last count, we're in 47 states, and we're used by STEM and science teachers as well as PE and um and in the after school program set and at camps and so those 
those lessons, as we just described how we kind of implement our curricula, are available um, for, the, for that use. And we're, having, we're getting great uh, replies on that. Perfect, thank you. And, and I also wanted to point out really quickly, uh, Julie has mentioned in the chat a couple of times, um, as people have been asking, you know, how do I answer these, you know, some of these questions that my kids might have about why this is important or what the math is. And what we'd really like to encourage the parents who are here with us today is to not just give them that answer, uh, but rather ask the questions that might help them find the answer for themselves. The most important thing that we can be doing as parents right now um, in this very unique time is supporting our kids' inquisitive nature and helping them um, both retain what they're learning in school from, from that perspective and to grow that ability to come up with a problem, to come up with a, a, a piece of knowledge that they don't have, and to find that answer um, by investigating and by exploring. Um, this has been a STEM Family Virtual Lab from STEM at Home, brought to you by the STEM Learning Ecosystems and TIES. Thank you to the Fraser family for exercising live on camera with us and for being our STEM family today. And thank you to our friends at STEM Sports. And thank you for joining us today. And come back next week on Tuesday, April 28th, for a community conversation where state officials, state level officials from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana will help us understand what leaders are currently thinking about and what steps they're taking to adjust to new learning demands. And join our next virtual lab, a virtual nature walk, discovering shapes and structures in nature happening next Thursday, the 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. These virtual labs revolve around successful models and new ideas to support STEM learning experiences during and beyond this time of social distancing. Stay tuned to stemecosystems.org for upcoming live events, resources, and more. Please continue to participate and share. I'm Jeremy Shore, and we will see you next time. Bye.